have you on board. We've already asked for questions, and so you should be able to get going if you'd like. Oh, great, great. Oh, well, it's, it would be better to see all of you in person. I miss you, but um, it hasn't been that long since last spring, so I, I hopefully everything's working out for all of you. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get the right, here it is, the right slide set up and get ready to go. So let me share my screen with you guys. And, and you know me, you should um, please stop and uh, ask me questions whenever you need to. It's a little difficult with you, with you guys um, being in just a little bit of a, a tab. So the best thing to do is actually to just speak up if you have questions, okay? And are you able to see somebody, somebody on live, give me a nod. Are you able to see the screen okay? Is it big enough to be able to see? Yeah. 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 Okay, great. So we're today, um, today, both now and after lunch, um, we're going to have an introduction to pharmacogenetics. So we talked about it a little bit last year when we went over the genetics portion of our of, of class um, back in uh, pathophysiology. So I want to remind you of a few things, um, ask you a few questions, but basically we're going to go on and um, have a, an introduction to pharmacogenetics. So you may hear both pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics being used as terms. And what, it's, so a lot of times um, when we talk about pharmacogenetics, some people think this is a study of the genetic basis for variation in drug response. And so, so we're looking at large effects and a very small amount of DNA variants. And some of these variants can kind of um, add up together. So there's a somewhat of an additive effect but you're pretty much looking at genes and, and specific um, variations and, and um, outcomes, right? So the outcomes could be that, uh, and we'll talk more about it later, but either the drug works or it doesn't work or it's harmful, right? Basically the three effects that we're looking at. So pharmacogenomics is typically the study of larger number of variants altogether in an individual or a population. And so we're trying to, under, to dig into the genetic component, component of different drug responses. So pharmacogenetics really combines pharmacology and genomics. And it actually, we're trying to use this to develop more specific medications. So have you all heard, I think we mentioned it last year, of personalized medicine? Okay, basically um, a, a medicine that is tailored to a specific person so that you get the best possible outcome. Okay. And so, you know, we, we can, these different variations in the genes can affect the way we process drugs and that's pharmacokinetics and you've got, you're learning that right now, right, with um, Erica Woodall. And then you've got now the interaction of drugs with receptors. So that is implied with pharmacodynamics, which you're also going to learn a lot with, um, with Erica. And then also treatment efficacy and basically trying to avoid those adverse side effects um, that can happen and pretty dangerously. And we'll go through some of those examples probably later this afternoon. So I'm going to get something to drink on my throat. So in looking at the modern era, we're looking at the Human Genome Project. And remember, we talked a little bit about the Human Genome Project last year as well. And so those advances really expanded our possibilities because now it was a lot easier to figure out um, what genes are present in our genome and from previous work knowing then typically more variants able to determine what is what is a quote-unquote normal version or the most common version and the most common version is what we all move towards in trying to pick up what our what we're going to do so you know when you have these uh, phase three or um, phase three uh, drug trials Basically, you're getting a huge cross-section of people 
and you're tr and you already know that the drug will work in a smaller number of people and that it's efficacious and you're trying to expand your population so that you understand if there are any minor effects that are coming along and what what the G human genome project allowed us to do was to really be able to more more precisely figure out what were the changes in certain genes that could affect how these drugs are going to act in people okay so you you guys have heard this, seen this slide before, right? The basics of genetics. So thinking about them, basically we want to know, and I wish you all were in front of me because we would be having a great conversation about this, but what is the difference between a gene and an allele? And then, um, so I don't know if anybody wants to speak up, you'd have to unmute yourself. No takers? What's a gene? Come on, guys. Don't make me think I was this bad of a teacher. Ah. Uh, An allele is a variation of a gene. Great. So, what's a gene? Simple like hereditary information. Yeah, it is has a hereditary information, but for what? A protein. Yeah, exactly. It's what codes a protein. Okay. So let's talk next about the difference between a mutation and a polymorphism. So do you remember me jumping up and down and talking about mutations? And that mutations aren't always bad. Is this bringing back memories? A mutation is an alteration in a DNA sequence. Correct. We don't have, it's, it's not, doesn't say anything about the quality of that, whether it's helpful or unhelpful about mutations being the drivers for evolution. But what is a polymorphism then? So a polymorphism is basically where it can happen over time. So it's not just a single event like the mutation, uh, right? There's a little bit more to it than that. Is it, um, is it a mutation that's found in like the population? I can't remember, is it like above 1% or something like that? Correct, that's exactly right. It's a mutation found in greater than 1% of a population. Okay, excellent. So now the relationship between a genotype and a phenotype. Who wants to take that one on? So the genotype is the genetic presentation, like the sequence, and the phenotype is the physical presentation of that? Correct. And so the phenotype is what the genotype makes you look like. And it can be um, what the protein looks like, what the enzyme looks like, what the, um, you know, what the receptor looks like, anything like that, all right? Um, we didn't go over haplotypes that much, so I'm going to wait and we'll present that later. But remember one of the things we talked a lot about was frequency. So why is frequency important? And frequency in the sense of polymorphisms. It's specifically helpful, or not helpful, but important in uh, pharmacy because, you know, it, we, we need to know how a population will respond to a medication. Um, or, or we can look at certain diseases and see if they affect uh, specific populations. Exactly. Good job. So it basically, when you talk about frequency, anytime you're talking about polymorphism, you have to set the stage. You need it to describe the population that you're talking about because something that may be a polymorphism in one population may be non-existent or the most common version of the gene in another population. So you have to describe which population you're looking at and the frequency there. So um, I threw this onto the next slide so that you would have it. But basically you have um, the functional unit of heredity is the exact um, definition of a gene. And basically what it is, is um, the, what encodes a protein. And the, the idea that the polymorphism crea um, is created by a 1% threshold. 
Um, so basically, if even one person in your class had a, a difference from the um, from the the canonical sequence of a gene, then that would constitute a polymorphism, okay? Because there's more than 50 of you in the class. So the twins genotype versus phenotype, the idea that twins have similar genotypes, but they may not always, in this case, identical twins, they may not always present in exactly the same way, but that's because of differences. Remember, we talked a little bit about epigenetics and how different changes, different marks on the gene, on genes without changing their sequence can change how they um, are presented or how they're expressed. And we talked back in, in genetics about the difference between different cell types, say a muscle cell and a skin cell and a neuron, when all have the same basic um, genetic makeup is how, first off, at when that gene's expressed and where it's expressed in the tissue or in the body and how much of it is expressed. And those three things are what determines the phenotype of that cell to make it a different type of cell, okay? So when you're talking about phenotype, anything that affects gene expression can affect gene phenotype, even if the genotype is identical, okay? And then remember we're talk when we talked about haplotype, I, I don't think we had a chance to go over this very well, but basically it's a set of single nucleotide polymorphisms found to be statistically associated on a single chromatid, okay? And that'll be important later on in the, in the um, talk here today. So when we talk about the benefits, why do we even care about pharmacogenomics? But basically we're trying to figure out which drug might be the best choice for a certain person and which dose is going to minimize those side effects that we don't want and maximize efficacy. We want people to not waste time taking a drug that's either going to harm them or not do them any good, okay? It also helps with targeted drug development. So if we know that there's a particular change in a gene that's responsible for, say, processing a drug, um, then we can target, if we know that that change affects how it works, then we can target it to that um, active site in order to be able to um, really affect the change that we want with that drug. Um, we all know that most drugs don't make it through clinical trials, about 90% or more fail, and it's because of typically um, they either don't work or they've got really tough side effects. But what if there was a percentage, you know, you would, you would fail a drug on a drug trial because you had 10% of the, of the um, the phase two participants that had a really bad side effect, but it worked great for the other 90%. So what if you could determine that there was a, a test or a, um, a way to sequence that gene so that you would know that this drug could be possible, could possibly be used for that many people? Then that drug could go on, and once you, once you limit who it can be um, prescribed for due to their genetic background, now, that's that much less waste of time, development money, testing money that has gone in and, and you, don't, you end up with a drug that is helpful for a lot of people, but they have to be selected based on their pharmacogenomics pro profile. Hopefully with pharmacogenomics, we can identify polygenic drug effects. Um, once again, more rapid drug development, identifying new targets, once again, if you have a polymorphism that changes an active site, and then you know that that's, that's the active site, that's where you've got to target your small molecule development to develop that drug. That's what folks upstairs on the fourth floor are doing. And then hopefully the bottom line is you can reduce healthcare costs. You also may um, get enhanced disease screening or enhanced disease screen or enhanced screening for disease risk, which is just as important, okay? So in the historical contents, um, a lot of times there have been inherited uncommon drug response traits that were just known. And one of those is that so, in some people, fava beans can have, a, you can have a potentially fatal reaction. This was known in ancient times that people will end up with hemolytic anemia from this. Um, Isan Izaid can have, in, 
um, have a neuropathy effect on people. Um, this brisoquin can have exaggerated hypotensive effects. Uh, succinylcholine, if you can't process that properly, prolonged neuromuscular blockade. So we, we knew that some things were harmful to some people, not all. We've always known it, but now we know why. So we're talk we talked about the benefits. So what are some of the challenges? Okay, The challenges are that um, pharmacogenomics and clinical practice is not cheap. Getting testing done is can be expensive. Until we have the day when we all have our genome on a chip, which we talked about in class, uh, that's not going to be possible. We've got a legal and ethical framework that really challenges this, and, and mainly because of the idea that of equal access. You know, if if you if tests are expensive and they're not always covered by insurance, and now not everybody has to have insurance, um, you know, it could be that it's just not ethically correct to do this type of testing, to provide benefits for some and not for all. Um, patient provider and provider education regarding, regarding pharmacogenomics testing is really challenging too. So um, I'm on a project with Erica Whittle, and one of the things that we did was to do um, provider interviews to find out what they knew about pharmacogenetic testing, um, whether they would use it, whether they could understand what the results were. And, um, you know, even though genetics has been come a long way and how it's presented in medical schools, there's still a lot that needs, that can't be covered because of time. And if providers aren't familiar with it, they're not going to use it unless it's absolutely required. We talk a lot about um, informed consent and the use of genetic information. And when you think about it, the ultimate pre-existing condition is what is contained in your genes. Nothing you can do about it, you were born with it. So until we have really adequate protections for um, pre-existing conditions, it's going to be a challenge sometimes to get somebody to have a genetic test done. Okay. Um, cost effectiveness. You know, it may be that trial and error is a whole lot less expensive than sending away a blood sample for um, genetic analysis. There are a lot of attitudes towards genetic testing um, that people are thinking that, um, once again, they're fearful of under, um, di discovering an underlying pre-existing condition. Um, there are people that think that that's just too much information for somebody else to have about you, those privacy concerns that we talked about last year. So um, there's, there is attitudes and attitudes by both patients and providers to overcome. Um, and then once again, you know, there's not a one size fits all. It's not always the case that uh, a polymorphism in a single gene can determine the response to a certain drug. That is really difficult. Um, so quite often, there are multiple genes that are affecting how drug responses go. And I mean, we talked a little bit about it with Warfarin last year. We'll go over it more again this year. But that's a case where you know there are two main genes that are responsible for the response of a person to Warfarin. So um, this complexity can be really can be much more than just two. It can be four. It can depends on how complex. The processing of that drug in that particular body person's body is. Ultimately, the challenge is that by using pharmacogenomics, um, you could lead to potentially smaller, more specialized drug markets, and you don't have people. And you know, the drug companies could charge a lot more for this, um, and you end up not worrying about developing things for the greater good. So. When we talk about pharmacogenetics, we're talking, we talked a little bit before about how it influences the pharmaceutical pipeline. So from, from gene, the gene sequence, we know what the protein target is. And by that protein, knowing what the protein target is, we can, we can screen this library of compounds to find out which version, which chemical compound is going to be the best at interacting with our target. So once this is once you've um, identified the lead compound, now you look at the chemical properties. You know maybe it's a great fit for this protein, but 
perhaps it's just totally insoluble. That's a real problem. That's not going to work. Um, maybe it fits in there perfectly well, but it doesn't work the way you think it should. That's another problem. So once you've identified that lead compound now, you can optimize that and then start going into the preclinical development of safety and e efficacy, right? So that's phase one and phase two, okay? So in phase one, we're looking at safety for different doses. In phase two, we're looking at small efficacy and, state and safety studies. So is this going to work in a small number of people? That gets expanded, okay, the first 50, the first 100 are okay. It's like these vaccine trials everybody's doing right now. Get into the bigger one, okay, is, is it safe? And is a, the dose range right? Is, is it, this gonna work for the majority of the people? And then here, then you move on to phase three, right? Looking at comparative safety and efficacy, is it's totally randomized and controlled so that you know that um, compared to a placebo, how is that working, right? And then basically, once you know that it's going to work for the majority of the people, it's not going to be so harmful that it, it really affects life and everything else for other people, then you can move on to licensing. So in those screens, every single time, you're, by selecting outpatients in phase two and phase cl three clinical trials, who would be non-responders, so this is the red, the folks depicted in red, then subsequent trials can be smaller because you can screen out the people that are going to be non-responders and, and concentrate your larger studies on just people who, for whom it will be working. Okay. Once again, if you guys have any questions or you need me to clarify anything, just speak up because I won't be able to see you if you raise your hand or anything like that. Hmm. Okay. So there are a ton of things, a ton of, of different parts in your body that will, that all play a role in how we, how we respond to drugs. And a lot of them are things that um, are control, not controllable, your age, your gender. Um, but a lot of things are the things that you can control. So um, state of pregnancy, exercise, your disease state. Do you have another infection? Are you having occupational exposures? Um, are there other drugs that you're taking that are going to affect this? Uh, circadian and seasonal variations in dietary supplements. Um, diet itself. Remember talking about grapefruit, right? And how that inactivates um, the, one of the SIP genes. Uh, cardiovascular, all these different immunological functions, body functions that are all dependent upon these other factors, and what the toll that stress plays on all this. And when you think about it right now, everyone is in an extremely stressful situation. Um, so, so we, I think we will find out down the ro road, even if we do not get COVID, um, the effect of so far, eight months, six, eight months of stress is taking uh, a toll on all of us and on our health. But all of these influence, um, it can influence the contribution of the genetic constitution together. So when we start to talk about now the pharmacogenetic contribution to pharmacokinetics, this is an example that we've used and we use a lot. So if we're looking at the half-life of a, the drug of antipyrine in, um, in patients, and these are identical twin pairs, you can see that it's, it's really similar in each of these twin pairs. Very, very similar. And then if you look at fraternal twin pairs, you can see that the half-life of the drug in these pairs sometimes is very similar but sometimes is very different depending upon what they have um, what they have inherited from the parents and fraternal twin twin studies are done because it tries to tease out the contribution of your genetic makeup versus the the influence of your environment growing up so the assumption is that fraternal twin pairs are going to have the exact same environment 
Um, and but identical twin pairs will have both the environment and the genetic makeup in um, in common. So just to remind you about some things, what are single nucleotide polymorphisms? Basically, a single base change, and they can be coding and non-synonymous. So they, in this case, they changed the codon for a proline to uh, uh, like, oh, what is GLN? Glutamate or glut? Uh, I can't remember. See, I never memorized anything that um, that I could look up in a book, so it's terrible. Um, it could be coding and synonymous. In this case, um, uh, a proline versus a proline. But remember, uh, I talked about the example here of ABCB1, where this is a synonymous SNP, and yet there was a phenotype. Um, that there was arose from that that was associated with it and couldn't figure out what it was for the long time until we figured out that um, the the uh, mutant codon or the polymorphic codon actually was a much less frequent had a much less frequent tRNA it was not commonly used and so by causing a delay in the synthesis of that of ABCD1 while we waited while the ribosome was waiting to find the right tRNA it caused misfolding in the peptide sequence. And so that was ubiquitinated and destroyed. The ultimate result of a synonymous polymorphism was a decrease in the amount of the transporter that was synthesized. So remember that example. And then we can have non-coding um, uh, SNPs and the promoters or in the introns that actually also then change perhaps the level of that protein is being made, or um, the way it's being um, being. Um, oh, why am I losing my words today? Uh, how that RNA is being spliced. So, if it affects in the intron, it affects the splice site. Then you're going to end up with a significant problem from a non-coding step. Okay. Um, remember, we talked about other variations, insertion deletion polymorphisms. Um, there's a 68 base pair uh, insertion that could then cause a problem or a repeat. We talked about repeat expansions and, and contractions in, in different uh, genes. And then the, the, the best one, the copy number variations where you have gene duplications. And we talked mainly about CYP2B6 where there are some people um, who have multiple copies, up to 13 copies in the gene, and therefore there were a lot of, um, they were kind of an ultra rapid metabolizer, right? So if they were given a prodrug, they would essentially overdose because the prodrug would be converted to the active drug form so rapidly that if you gave the person the normal dose, they would end up with an overdose. And what you would have to do is reduce the dose for a person who you knew was an ultra rapid metabolizer. And then we have large deletions where the entire, in 50% of the, of the European American population, GSTM1 is totally missing. Fortunately, we've got GSTT1 and GSTP1 who, who perform the same function. And the glutathione, these are glutathione S transferases. Okay. Anybody have any questions? What the population was that you said that's missing the GSTT one? Oh, the European Americans, the Caucasian population, and they're missing. We're missing G GST M one. Any other oh, questions? What? Sorry. I'm sorry, Rebecca. Why would it only be the European Americans? Are the Europeans like originally also missing this? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. It's just that the studies that I'm I'm citing were done in um in the U.S. Okay, perfect. Thank sure. Any other questions? But fortunately, there, there's a lot of redundancy, um, especially in, in genes that are involved basically in toxicity remediation in the body. Because remember, um, our bodies weren't developed to deal with drugs. Our bodies were, and the enzymes and all the things we talk about were, were developed to deal with poisons, basically, or, or thing, other things from our environment, from our diet, from whatever that could cause us harm. 
So they were basically arose as mechanisms to inactivate harmful compounds. Okay. The fact is that, that the, the um, drugs can, are reacting with these um, enzymes is, is just uh, unfortunate. It helps make those drugs, some efficacy uh, effects on some of the drugs, especially the pro-drugs that have to be activated to be an active drug. Okay. So one of the things that we need to talk about is the consequences of the very variation. And this is kind of we included some of this in the previous slides, but basically for, for um, genes that encode um, in these cases, the CYP enzymes or other enzymes, TPMT. Um, these are the things that we talked about earlier that you have non-synonymous substitutions, splice site mutations. So you end up do either including a, um, a different um, exon or excluding an exon or including part of an exon. Um, early stop codons, which basically creates a non-functional protein. Increased proteolysis, so the drug is, is degraded more rapidly, or I mean the, the enzyme is um, degraded more rapidly. And then once again, change promoter function. So controlling how much of that gene is expressed at, you know, from the get-go, not that it's um, made incorrectly or has a polymorphism in it, but basically how much of it is made is wrong, either too much or too little. So remember way back when to the nomenclature of genomic regions where we have, just to remind you, you have five prime untranslated region and the three prime untranslated region at the tail end of the gene. We've got poly A signals, stop codons that are contained in the last exon before the poly A signal, and these exons here. Um, so the promoters that are close by um, are called the proximal promoters, okay? And so quite often, if um, you have repeats up here in the promoter, this can affect the qualitative expression of, of this gene, okay? So if we have um, a most common genetic form and we think that the rate of metabolism um, is depicted by this red line. We, we can have two different, um, two different consequences, basically. And remember, remember, we talked about this a lot in the lab that we had last fall. But basically, you can either increase the KM or you can decrease the Vmax. Those are two common changes that will occur in that rate of metabolism of that enzyme that you're looking at. So um, remember back in the beginning, we talked a little bit about haplotype. Well, the, there's um, something called haplotype blocks. And basically the haplotype is a series of polymorphisms um, or a series of sites for potential polymorphisms that are inherited um, closely together on a single chromatid, okay? The example here is um, UGT1A1, which is UDP glycosyl transferase 1 family of polypeptide A1. And so um, we didn't talk about the concept of linkage disequilibrium um, because we didn't have time last year. Um, but basically, linkage disequilibrium means that um, two sites on a chromosome are inherited together more frequently than you would expect by chance. So it actually implies that they're closer together. And so these sites are all in linkage disequilibrium. They're all typically inherited together more likely than not. Okay. And so the, what this is showing you is that this is the linkage disequilibrium between the single nucleotide polymorphisms in Europeans. So if the, if the SNPs, remember we talked about the definition of a polymorphism is something that's present at greater than 1% in the population. Well, this, these are data from uh, Europeans. And if the polymorphism is 
um, present at 20% or greater, then they're given these RS designations. So these RS numbers are, are located all along the um, chromosome here. Um, the basic idea of this is that, um, and the way I've used it in research, is that if I know that these seven polymorphisms are all inherited together, I don't have to look at somebody's um, DNA at each one of these seven sites. If I interrogate a single site, a sentinel site, and determine the polymorphism that's present, because of linkage disequilibrium, I can pretty well know what the rest of those polymorphisms are that are present. And therefore, I will know if, they have, if those polymorphisms have multiple effects on the, the protein function that I'm looking at, then I can figure out what is going to happen with the protein function there by just interrogating a single polymorphism. Okay. It's not an easy concept. It's, you got to really think about this. And, um, but if you think about it and have questions, we'll start off at one with questions so that um, we can go back over this if you want. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. So when we talk about the consequences of variation, I'm going to, we're going to go over two examples. We're going to talk about um, two different membrane transporters. So this is the dopamine transporter, DAT. Um, and it is, you can see that here's the extracellular space and here's the cytoplasm. And this is the, is the in, intermembrane. Okay, so the interior of the membrane. So like most transporters, it had, this has a lot of transmembrane domains. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 transmembrane domains. Okay, so quite a complex protein. And I mean, dopamine is extremely important. So it makes sense that there's going to be um, a, a transporter that's going to have a lot of control over it. What we're showing is um, the polymorphisms that were found in an ethnically diverse DNA sample of Americans. Um, so the blue circles here are synonymous variants. So you can see that you don't have any non-synonymous variants. And that's an indication of how important that transporter is because if you had a non-synonymous variant, it might be more likely to disrupt the function of that, of that um, gene, of that transporter. And that transporter is critical, critically important, okay? And you'll also notice that there weren't too many um, polymorphisms that were present in the intramembrane region. Once again, um, you know, if you have polymorphisms out here, that could affect how the, um, the dopamine is interacting at the um, external of the cell versus the polymorphisms here, how the, how the second messenger is passed along. You're, all of these are synonymous. So none of these are changing the amino acid that's being contained there, okay? When you look at the multidrug resistance protein 2, MP, MRP2, and you look at the, once again, a really extensive transmembrane domains, right? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 17 transmembrane domains. Once again, you have a significant number of, of synonymous changes or variants which you don't expect then, that's not going to change the amino acid sequence. But look in this case. Now here you have quite a few non-synonymous variants. You have them present in the extracellular domain, in the intracellular domain, and also throughout the, um, the, the um, transmembrane domains, okay? Really interesting change. 
once again, multidrug resistance protein. Um, have you gotten to what multidrug resistant proteins do yet in, uh, in PK? And you guys just started PK, right? So what multidrug resistance proteins do is another type of transporter. What it does is it takes um, drugs that have gotten inside the cell and kicks them out, basically transports them out against a gradient. And so this is what, and these um, genes can develop to, in response to different types of drugs. So quite often when you're treat, treating a cancer patient and you treat them with a drug, what you do end up doing is upregulating their uh, multidrug resistant proteins. And they start, a drug that worked at the beginning starts getting spit out and stops working. And so that's when you move the patient on to a different chemotherapy. So these are both talking about single drugs. I think we're going to stop there because number one, my, my throat is really, really dry from talking for two straight hours. But number two, you guys need a chance to get up and walk around and get some lunch and, and think about it. So we'll pick up here when we come back at one. And um, if you have any questions on anything we've gone over already, please be prepared to, to let's talk about that as well. All right. Any questions before we take a break? Thanks, Liz. All right. We'll see you in a bit. Yeah. You guys take care. I miss you. See you soon.